So, hello everybody. Welcome to another of our series of talks about frontiers in ecological niche modeling, uh, or frontiers in distributional ecology, if you prefer. Um, I'm joined today by Devon Dirad, um, and Devon is a doctoral student in the Division of Ornithology here at the Biodiversity Institute in the University of Kansas. And he's been been leading some of the work that um, has been has been in process in our group with starting to understand the genomic basis of ecological niches. So Devin, why don't you go ahead and share the presentation and let's jump into this. Okay, so again, this is work that's been developed by the the KUENM working group, and through the through this course, you have seen a bunch of uh, papers that have been developed by that group, um, going all the way back to to Barve et al. 2011. Uh, but it's a, simply a working group amongst Jorge's and my students, and students from several other professors, including Devin, who 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 is studying with with Rob Moyle. Um, but it's just a, a working group that takes on difficult topics and uh, works them out and turns them into publications. So go, to, go on to the next slide, Devin. So this, this question of the genetic basis of ecological niches, um, it's been an important question for quite a while because we've talked, you know, since, since the 1990s, We've talked about fundamental ecological niches as a genetically based, evolved, long-term stable constraint on the distributional potential of species. And so uh, given that, uh, it has to have a genetic basis. And yet that basis is not understood and yet important. So early insights, um, such as this, this um, paper up in, in the upper right, Conservatism of Ecological Niches in Evolutionary Time, that was a paper that Jorge and I and Victor Sanchez Cordero in Mexico uh, developed that showed that there was phylogenetic inertia in niche characteristics. And a whole bunch of, of papers since then, coming all the way up to 2020, has focused on on essentially being able to reconstruct the evolutionary history of these niches. Go ahead. So that insight that there's that there's phylogenetic inertia that, that the, there's essentially uh, a, a slow progression of change in in ecological niches. It leads to some really interesting questions that were completely inaccessible to us until very recently. Uh, for instance, if we know the genomic basis of ecological niches, we can ask whether niche change or niche differences or niche variation is based on one or a few genes of large effect or many genes of small effect. And so that's essentially you know, is there perhaps even a Mendelian pattern of inheritance where uh, there are very few states that can be different in a niche and it might switch from, you know, one state to another based on the presence of one allele? Or if it's a polygenic trait, then it, it can have many states that are in between the extremes based on different combinations of different causal genes. And then a second question, oh, hold on, go back if you would. A second question is, are there uh, linked or correlated responses uh, where a single gene or a single site in a gene uh, responds to multiple dimensions of the environment? And we'll, we'll see that later in this talk. Uh, more generally, um, after we start to understand the genomic basis of ecological niches, we can start to ask questions like, um, do different derivations of certain types of niches 
have the same genetic basis, which is uh, to say, are they genuinely convergent or are they genomically based on different combinations of genes or even different, different sets of genes entirely? Now go ahead, please. So the key to all of this is that uh, gene sequence data uh, and especially genome sequence data have become very, very cheap. So there's a phenomenon called Moore's law, which is essentially an expected rate of increase of uh, computational capacity. And you can see that in, in this graphic where on a log scale, you can see the, the increasing rate of calculations per second that become possible um, through time. And um, that translates into many of the abilities that we need to be able to sequence genomes. Go ahead to the next slide. And so here's the Moore's Law expectations. And you know, 20 years ago, the cost of sequencing the human genome was something like $100 million. And Moore's Law had the expectation of that, uh, that sequencing efficiency going down um, precipitously by orders of magnitude, um, but, but gradually in a, in a, a semi-log space. And you can see that the actual cost per human genome followed Moore's Law for six years, and it followed it pretty closely. But then with the invention of what, what's called uh, next generation sequencing technology, you can see that the cost per genome went down massively. And so currently, uh, it's more than two orders of magnitude less in terms of cost um, than you would expect based on Moore's Law. All this is just a way of saying that sequencing is cheap now. And that means, of course, that we don't just sequence single genes the way we did 10, 15, 20 years ago, but rather we sequence all genes or a huge sample of genes. And so that means that, that we're getting a, a massive, dense, and at times even comprehensive view of genetic and genomic variation. Next slide. So what we're going to do in this, in this talk and in this, in this research effort is essentially to take advantage of the fact that different populations of a species can be found under very different conditions. So look at, here's Ixodes scapularis, which is a tick that transmits Lyme disease across the Eastern US and Southern Canada. Um, and all I want you to see is that the populations in the Northeast are existing under very different conditions from the populations in the South. And, you know, you'll remember that we have the generic assumption that um, the niche is the same across a species, but we've never really trusted that assumption. Regardless, we would expect that genes that um, that allow heat tolerance would probably be favored in these southern populations, and genes that allow survival of rough winters or cold tolerance or maybe quick reproductive cycles might be favored in these northern uh, situations. And so essentially what we're going to do in this overall enterprise is looking look for uh, signals of this, this uh, these selective forces within species, but among populations that are existing under different conditions. Next slide. So what Devin and I are going to do in this presentation is we're going to follow the example of, of quite a number of, of previous studies um, using tools in what's called functional genomics. Uh, we're going to build on a very small number of previous explorations of the genomic basis of dimensions of ecological niches, 
Those have been mostly in marine systems, but it's a very small number. We're going to take massive advantage of massive ability or availability of genomic data from large numbers of individuals. And we're going to take one species um, and we're going to analyze it in great detail. And the idea is to begin to illuminate uh, what is the, genetic, the genomic and genetic basis for ecological niches? Go ahead, Deva. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to take a step back and talk about functional genomics and sort of come at it from the genomics aspect rather than the niche aspect. Um, so to give some broad background here, uh, functional genomics is basically our way of understanding the relationship between the genotype and the phenotype um, of an individual or across a population. And there's many ways that we can get at that, whether it's through whole genome sequencing, as Tom talked about, um, or some of the quickly evolving methods such as proteomics and metabolomics, which are asking questions even above the genome level about what the protein structures um, and RNA data are telling us about the phenotype of an individual. And I also wanted to note that phenotype can be a physical characteristic, which is usually how we think of it. Um, but in our case, phenotype is an ecological trait. And that's how we're using it in order to get at niche evolution. Um, so I wanted to give some examples of functional genomics. And this is, I think, one of the most classic functional genomics systems and papers out there. Um, this was done by Hopi Hoekstra, and there's this beach mouse system in the Florida Peninsula, and you can see the phenotype that they're measuring here is coat color, and there's those five different coat colors along the peninsula, each of which is adapted to its unique environment so, um, to avoid predation. The coat color matches the sand color of the beach, at a given location. And what Hopi Hoekstra and colleagues found is that the genotype at a specific locus, MC1R, was um, associated statistically with the coat color. And you can see the white portion of those pie charts is the light allele of MC1R, and the dark portion of those pie charts is the dark allele um, and when I talk about alleles, I'm talking about um, the same gene in every individual and just a different sequence variant. Um, so we'll keep talking about alleles throughout this, um, this talk, and that's generally what we're referring to when we say allele. Um, even near and dearer to my heart, we're talking about um, as an ornithologist is bill size and Darwin's finches. Um, this is a slightly more complex example. This was recent work in molecular ecology that showed across three different species of Darwin's finches that they found about a handful of genes associated with bill size. And you can see that on the Manhattan plot on the bottom. And those individual lines um, associated with each gene are showing the significance on the x axis or the, excuse me, the y-axis of each of those genes in predicting the size of the bill for um, these Darwin's finches. And you can see in the top panel, they have three separate species that they're including in this. Um, and we will also talk more about this going forward, but it's important to correct for population structure and the relationship between the genetic relationship between the individuals um, that you're studying when we're trying to get at a specific trait. Uh, one more great bird example of functional genomics is the use of genome-wide association to identify plumage patches in these hybridizing vermivora warblers. Um, they used the fact that these warblers hybridize extensively, so you had lots of back crosses and intergrades that had unique phenotypes. Um, and then they were able to statistically associate those phenotypes with the genotype of the individual. Um, and in this case, as accurately as 
basically perfect prediction from this ACIP locus that if you had one allele or variant of the gene, you were getting a black throat. And if you had a different allele, you were getting a white or yellow throat. Um, and amongst, I believe, a few dozen individuals that they sampled, they had perfect prediction of that phenotype based on this genotype. So in functional genomics, um, I showed some of the classic cases um, that have been done recently, and I just wanted to talk about why these cases are so specifically focused on very visible phenotypes. Um, and Town got at a lot of this when he was talking about the decreasing cost of sequencing. Um, that was a big problem for a while. And the other thing to notice is that these are all natural systems. So we're focused on trying to find genotype phenotype associations in natural systems. And that can be really powerful when we can leverage some natural experiments that are occurring in the wild. But it can also make it difficult to get appropriate sample size in order to have statistical power to predict these traits. Um, but as we'll see later in the talk, the statistical methods for um, looking for genotype phenotype association are rapidly um, in rapid development and constantly improving. And that's quite exciting that we're quickly moving towards a place where we can predict genotype phenotype in natural systems um, in increasingly non, uh, increasingly complex and nuanced situations like ecological niche. Um, and to that end, here are two papers that I was quite excited about recently um, that are getting at those more nuanced situations. So one is the genetic basis for salt tolerance in rice. And as you can see, they associated a few genes strongly with salt tolerance, which is closer to that ecological um, information that we're searching for. And the other is um, about spawning time and herring. And they used genome-wide association to show that um, on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, the spawning time in these herring are uh, determined by different loci, um, indicating parallel evolution of the same spawning time via different genetic mechanisms. Back to you, Tom, whenever you're good. OK. so. One really crucial thing that, that Devin mentioned is that uh, when you're looking across tens of millions of base pairs and looking for these associations, any population structure, any, any reason why two populations might be different uh, can be a pretty important confounding factor. And so it's very important to find groups that have minimum, minimal uh, differentiation, uh, very recent derivation, because otherwise you're just going to be flooded by uh, spurious uh, differences. Like maybe your, your arid tolerant populations have been evolving in isolation from your humid, humid tolerant populations for even just 10,000 years, you're going to find a lot of SNPs, a lot of sites in the genome that associate with that difference, but maybe are not causal. So we set out to look for a species that did not have much uh, structure in it. Um, Suffice it to say, there are not many species where you can do this sort of analysis at this moment. But the number of kind of massively intensively sequenced species that are out there is improving and changing quite quickly. So we settled on Anopheles gambii, which is um, part of a complex of species that is uh, intensively studied because it's responsible for uh, a lot of malaria transmission across Africa. And this is a complex of seven or eight species um, 
but the one of the most widespread of those species is Anopheles gambiae sensu stricto, which is to say the restricted version of Anopheles gambiae rather than the whole complex. And it's distributed across much of Africa. And so it occurs under fairly diverse environmental circumstances. Next slide. So this is a species that, uh, that I, I and others have, have studied um, periodically over the years. You can see uh, the distribution of, of Gambiae is here shown in B, and you can see it stretches across Africa, um, West Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, from the essentially the southern rim of the, uh, the Sahara Desert into the Congo, and then into the more temperate zone regions in, in Southern Africa. Go ahead, next one. And you know, we've done explorations of uh, the effects of climate change. And I'm going to remind you of Alexandre Dinis Filio's uh, presentation earlier in the, in the Frontiers section of ENM 2020, where he talked about evolutionary rescue. Well, these maps, and in fact, this whole paper that I published a number of years ago, uh, they show these areas of apparent range retraction, uh, which was interesting because it meant that those sites would be less suitable, and yet those are some of the most populated sites in Africa. And so essentially what, what I showed or what I suggested could happen was a lowering of the overall malaria disease burden thanks to climate change. Well, if Alexandre's evolutionary rescue can occur, then these populations might be able to adapt to the drying conditions in that region. And they may be able to maintain there and essentially eliminate the, the climate change benefit that I had talked about in this paper. Next slide. So, you know, let's think about Anopheles gambiae in the context that we've used throughout this course. Uh, let's look at it in geographic and environmental dimensions. And all I want you to see is, you know, here's our geographic range. Um, you guys know full well after 34 previous weeks of this course, you know that these dots on the map reflect the range of the species. They probably also reflect some errors and they probably also reflect some gaps in data availability. It, we basically know that this species is found in the DRC, but there appears not to be much reporting from the DRC. Um, but regardless, that's, that's essentially what we have as, as knowledge in a correlative ecological niche modeling sense. And if we take this map and go over into environmental dimensions, we can see quite a bit that looks like a niche, which is to say, let's just look at this plot of annual precipitation versus annual mean temperature. And what we see is that our species Again, there are probably some outliers, which could be real, or they could be wrong georeferences or wrong species IDs, okay? All I'm using this for is to, to give you the example. But I want, what I want you to see is that temperature-wise, the species appears to be fairly general, but it appears that it responds fairly strictly to a, a precipitation limit. This is probably reflecting the northern limit of the species uh, in Africa. Uh, but notice that it appears to get down to drier areas when temperatures are particularly high. So we've got some things that don't look particularly ellipsoidal. Um, and that would be really interesting to explore um, if one were going deeper into the correlative dimensions of this species. But suffice it to say, we can see very clearly 
that this is a species that is precipitation limited. Okay, something about water availability matters to this species. So that's essentially the, the correlative uh, precursor to what we want to do now with completely independent data. Go ahead, Devin. So uh, the KUENM group about a year and a half ago set out on a really interesting exploration where we were, we were wondering what would be the ideal model species for asking some of these broad questions about distributional ecology. So we wanted species for which there were a lot of occurrence data because that's what correlative niche modeling uses. We wanted species where um, we had good physiological data. We wanted genomes. We wanted um, a good up-to-date taxonomy. We wanted a rigorous phylogeny. It was very interesting. We took quite a while to do this exercise. And what we concluded was no species fit the bill. No species was kind of the ideal model species in all of the dimensions in which we were interested. And that was frustrating, but it also says something about what we call a model species. So, you know, Drosophila melanogaster is, is a, um, is a really well-known species. The genome has been sequenced. Um, the physiology is known very well. And yet there's very little in the way of distributional data for wild populations of the species. Well, we, we settled on an interesting species as Anopheles gambii uh, because there's some physiological work as you've seen, there's a lot of distributional data. It's actually not a good rigorous phylogeny for the whole genus Anopheles. Um, but the interesting thing was that you have this um, genomic epidemiology network, malaria gen, uh, that has this project AG1000G. And what this is, is an international collaboration using whole genome deep sequencing to provide a high resolution view of genetic variation in nat natural populations of Anopheles gambii, the principal vector of malaria in Africa. And literally, this is a, an older view, but literally uh, there are more than a thousand full genomes available for this species. And so, you know, we have in the KUENM group, we have a huge thank you to give to this malaria gen group um, for the, the fairly generous and selfless work that they've done where they've put in huge efforts to collect samples from across Africa, uh, develop the deep sequencing, and, and they've published some very insightful publications but they've also made the data openly available. So a, a big thank you to the, to the malaria gen group. And um, that's what makes the analyses that we're gonna show you now possible. Go ahead, go ahead, Dan. So this is one of their publications. And again, we're building on, on the, the basis of the data and the insights that this group has developed. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our results so far. Um, as Town said, this is ongoing. We're um, almost done with data analysis on this project, but um, we used their phase one sampling, which was the slide that Town had just shown, which is 765 samples from 14 localities across Africa, and you can see those um, in the orange dots across the map there. Um, and additionally, since that paper came out, I believe in 2017, they've added a phase two of sampling, which was 376 additional samples. And you can see they also added some new localities in that phase two data set, including um, Mayo Island off the 
the eastern coast of Africa and a, a few interesting localities. So we started by extracting precipitation, humidity, and temperature for each of these localities that you can see on the map here. Um, and also I want to add that you can see the GBIF occurrences shown as those black pluses on the map. And you can see that um, our sampling is pretty geographically broad and covers most of the, the range of the species in Africa. Um, the AG1000G group identified um, over 50 million high quality variants uh, across the genome. And because, uh, because of computational concerns and because the genes that we are interested in are common and broadly relevant across the range of the group, we filtered those for a minor allele frequency of 0.05, just meaning that um, the less common variant needed to be present in at least 5% of the genotypes. Um, and that allowed us to gain computational traction and to focus on these broadly relevant variants that we are interested in. Um, and once we had our 3 million variants that we were interested in, we used three different methods for trying to associate genotype with phenotype, which is, um, again, phenotype is our environmental variable in this case. Um, and we use latent factor mixed models um, implemented in R which is uh, a regression-based method that's doing individual regressions between genotype values and um, ecological values at each SNP across the genome and calculating a p-value for the association. Um, we also used Bayesian uh, gene environment scans. And this method is using FST or differentiation between the populations to search for um, differentiation outliers that are likely associated with selection. Um, we think natural selection in this population, this species, um, and then associating those with our environmental variables again. Um, and the last method we used is random forest regression trees, um, which is a machine learning algorithm that we are just putting into place now and the idea is that it's using regression just like the latent factor mixed models are, but um, it's calculating a variable importance measure, which can take into account the effect of multiple, uh, multiple SNPs acting in parallel on the same phenotype. So we're hoping that that will give us an even more nuanced look into how these um, individual variants are acting by themselves on our given phenotypes and also in concert. Um, and as Town said, to just harp on this one more time, we corrected for population structure in each of these three implementations. Um, you can see in the figure on the right, the population structure across the species. As Town said, there is not, um, there are very few perfect model species that have no population structure that would confound you across their entire range. Um, and this, this complex is no different. So you can see from the structure plot at the top that there are some, some really unique um, genetic groups across the, con the continent. And we wanted to make sure we corrected for that population structure so that we weren't confounded once we were searching for our associations. Um, a final, some extra steps actually that we took in order to sort of refine our analyses, um, we implemented a naive Bayes classifier, which is a machine learning algorithm that can be implemented through R. And we trained it um, based on just visual identification of whether the allele frequencies we were looking for were matching, um, sort of uh, intellectually matching what we were, the pattern we were looking for. So you can see in those plots on the right, um, the x-axis is the humidity for a given locality, and the y-axis is the um, frequency of the non-reference allele. So what we're searching for is a, uh, a correlation between the genotypes at a given locality and the humidity at that geographic location. Um, and we had a lot of our outlier SNPs looked the way we expected them to. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, with a, a broadly relevant correlation across the entire continent. Um, but we also had some of these outlier SNPs that were identified by our methods where the entire relationship was driven by a single population. And you can see that the, um, the correlation between humidity and allele frequency in the bottom panel is not flat. So we are finding some relationship, but it's all driven by that one outlier population. Um, so we classified these as being false positives and used our naive Bayes classifier to remove them from our data set for downstream analysis. The second thing we did to refine our results was to use that phase two data set that I talked about at the very beginning. So all of our um, initial genotype phenotype associations were run using the 765 individuals from phase one. And then on top of that, we took our outlier SNPs plotted them uh, to visually inspect this relationship between allele frequency and humidity or any given ecological variable. And then also plotted the phase two data with unique sampling localities on top of that data and asked whether they matched. Um, again, using the naive Bayes classifier to classify matches from mismatches. And you can see in the top panel, um, and for some SNPs, the phase two data match perfectly indicating that this um, relationship holds up across deeper sampling. And for some of our SNPs, the relationship actually completely reversed, indicating that some of those unsampled populations um, regarding the phase one data set actually directly contradicted the relationship we were finding. So we removed those from our downstream analyses as well. Um, we made Manhattan plots showing, um, excuse me, <clears throat> our Manhattan plots show the association between each of our um, ecological variables. And these are the two methods that we have implemented so far, the LFMM and base scan. And what we can see is that there are really unique SNPs identified between the two methods and also between ecological variables. Um, you can see some peaks, like the one that's highlighted here on chromosome 2L, are um, pretty much shared across almost every method and every variable that we looked for. And in contrast, you've got some other peaks here, um, like this one on LFMM precipitation, that looks like a significant outlier in terms of being associated with precipitation, but um, has very little going on in all the other variables and methods that we looked at. Um, we also wanted to compare variables directly, um, and that's within each of the two methods that we've implemented. You can see on the left for base scan, um, the y-axis is association with temperature, and the x-axis is association with pre precipitation. Um, and what we see is a lot of unique interactions. Um, many of the significant and highly significantly associated SNPs in one of our variables um, are then not as significantly associated in the other variable. Um, in LFMM, we see sort of a similar pattern, but then also uh, a significant amount of uh, SNPs that are correlated. Uh, there are p-values calculating the significance of association with each of the variables are tightly correlated. And you can see that in sort of that uh, 45 degree angle stripe coming out from the bottom left corner of that right hand plot. Um, those are SNPs that are tightly associated um, between their significance of precipitation association and temperature association. Um, and that's indicating to us that although there is some independence in these response these responses, um, there are likely SNPs that are um, being used to respond to multiple environmental axes at the same time. Um, oh, I wanted to throw this in just a word of caution, something we're still working on um, is trying to understand how local patterns of recombination um, across the genome might affect these inferences. Um, this 
bottom panel is actually from one of the papers from the um, AG1000G consortium where they painted the chromosomes according to the genetic structure of that region of the genome. And you can see, um, I wanna focus specifically on chromosome two here. On 2R, there's that purple region that is um, an inversion. And there's that sort of army green region that is also an inversion. And what we can see specifically with our base scan results is that there are these large, um, not sure what you would call them, like tapuis of, um, of outlier association that are found really tightly associated with those inverted regions. Um, and what I think is going on here is that uh, a method like Bayes scan that is doing looking for outlier differentiation um, is being confounded by the inversions in those regions and finding a lot of SNPs that are more differentiated than we would expect under neutrality. But instead of that being associated with local adaptation to environmental differences, I think it's associated with these inversions. Um, so this is something we're gonna keep trying to work on and make sure that we are taking into account. Um, but it's just always important to recognize that there's, the genome is extremely complicated and it's important to take into account um, that it's not a single entity, it's always recombining and different regions of the genome have fundamentally different evolutionary histories. And um, although we can account for population structure, there's multiple levels at which we should be aware of these differences. Um, nonetheless, uh, we did some gene ontology overrepresentation testing to see preliminarily what we um, what types of genes we're finding as outliers. And um, I thought it was pretty exciting. Our LFMM humidity search, the number one overrepresented go term category was transmembrane transport, um, which I think you can sort of, I can sort of putatively speculate that um, transporting solutes would be associated with the, the water availability in your habitat. Um, and we found some interesting genes that I've highlighted on the bottom, which um, are not only associated with this potentially environmentally associated um, go term, but are also implicated separately in selective sweeps, um, which have been identified again by that AG1000G consortium. Um, and these are genes that are known to have been under strong selection in specific Anopheles gambii populations. And the fact that we're implicating these genes in our selection analyses is really encouraging. So getting at those three um, fundamental questions that Town asked at the beginning of the talk, uh, what's the genomic architecture of ecological niche being the first one? Um, I think we can confidently say as we expected that we think ecological niche is extremely polygenic. Um, we're gonna find many SNPs of small effect and using as many um, sort of um, parallel methods as possible possible to try to weed through the noise that are associated with these analyses um, to pick out some of the specific signals is really important in order to identify what we assume is many genes of small effect, um, which going back to the functional genomics uh, primer that I gave at the beginning is pretty much the hardest thing to identify um, when we have a discrete phenotype that's only under only has a few genomic regions underlying it, it's easy to pick those out from the noise. But when we have many regions across the genome of small effect, um, it's really important to take as much care as possible in our statistical analyses and try to sort the signal from the noise. Um, are the responses to environmental variables linked um, or correlated in any way? I think Preliminarily, we can say yes and no. Um, we've got some SNPs that are definitely acting strongly in one dimension and not in others. Um, but we've also got a pretty decent indication that there's a good, there's a 
significant category of SNPs that are um, acting in a correlated fashion across multiple environmental axes, as you can see on that right-hand plot again. Um, and finally, do different derivations of certain types of niches have the same genetic basis? Um, we think overall, again, that there is some correlation between the, um, the different environmental axes we looked at, but ultimately we think most of these SNPs are actually acting somewhat independently. Uh, we see a big overlap in our significant SNPs between humidity and precipitation, which makes sense um, because those two, and you could imagine that those two environmental variables um, are not only correlated across geographic space across the continent of Africa, but are also um, creating similar selection pressures in our population of interest. But overall, across all three of our variables, only 812 SNPs for LFMM at least, were um, implicated significantly in all three. And that's around five or 10% of our total SNPs, so not um, an overwhelming proportion. And I just wanted to note that um, we are really excited about these results, but they also are fundamentally um, a small step forward in terms of understanding the true genetic basis of niche. Um, and all of our, all of these analyses and results that I showed today are fundamentally correlative. Um, we're asking, is there a correlation between these two, uh, the genotype and the phenotype? And we're not actually um, putting together a statistical framework where we can say this genotype um, causatively predicts this phenotype. Um, but the hope is that the candidate gene lists that we can come up with from that are associated with each of these environmental variables can be the basis for future work that is done potentially in a lab using some of these new technologies to create transgenic organisms and eventually um, actually have that causative framework to say when we put the dry adapted allele um, from one population into uh, a different population that doesn't have that allele, we can actually increase the tolerance of that population. And that's some of the exciting work that I think is coming in the future. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, this this is a first study or a one of the first studies um and i think it's it's worth given that we're in a course on on um, distributional ecology it's worth thinking about what we learn um i think one very interesting dimension in which we can ask that question is as regards this this idea of evolutionary rescue and essentially um uh, Alexandre and and um, and his colleague uh, Bini um, have laid out the idea that that essentially evolutionary adaptation could act to reduce the losses of populations associated with essentially that trailing edge in 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 climate change related distributional shifts. And it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting because to be able to answer that question, they had to make assumptions about what the genetic basis of niche uh, is. And uh, I've talked about this with, with Alexandre, and he was very interested in what we're doing because because we'll we'll give or results like what we've gotten will give a first view of um, of that that potential, essentially being highly polygenic, uh, essentially with, for example, humidity tolerance being driven by lots of genes of small effect. It means um, that you have more genetic variation available across populations of the species. Um, with which to do that adaptive response. 
And so that's the sort of thing where I'd, I'd love to uh, talk with Alexandre down the road and ask, well, okay, here's a, here's a species, Anopheles gambiae, where its retraction from that area around the Dahomey Gap in West Africa means a lot as far as malaria transmission to humans. And so what is the likelihood of evolutionary rescue occurring? Go ahead, Devin. No, sorry. <laughs> I was just... No, go ahead and change the slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have that sort of question. Go ahead to the next one. Uh, but we also have many more questions and we've been we've been dancing around these questions for the last 34 weeks. Uh, what are the evolutionary dynamics of niche? Well, that will depend on the the genetic basis of niche. For example, if you had uh, niche characteristics that are determined by by few genes of large effect, then you can have essentially more easily you can have large changes in niche. Whereas if you have a high, highly polygenic basis for niche traits, then you're gonna see more gradual changes and potentially more possibility of local adaptation. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, go ahead and click through this. <laughs> um, there we go. So uh, what we are, seeing into the future is the potential to link individual genotypes to individual phenotypes as regards niche, and then be able to link population genetic characteristics of, uh, uh, to the population niche characteristics. So we essentially start to make the connection between what's going on at the individual level up to the level that distributional ecology pays attention, which is you know, populations and species. And in fact, we can go a step farther and we could look across, not just Anopheles gambiae, but across the whole gambiae complex or the whole of, of Anopheles or all mosquitoes. And we could ask, are these causal genes or candidate causal genes that we've detected in this study, do those relate in a non-random way to the environmental circumstances under which other species are found? So for example, Gambiae is the humid tropical member of its, of its species group, but there's another species, Anopheles arabiensis, which is the drier tropical, but drier and more, more seasonal member of the of the complex. Well, we would expect or we could predict that uh, the the dry related uh, SNPs that we've picked out within Anopheles gambiae might be found in Arabiensis. And essentially, you know, those are testable hypotheses. And those are questions that will tell us getting back to that, that question that I listed of when we see multiple derivations of, let's say, a dry niche, are they convergent or are they different genomic solutions to the same environmental challenge? So suffice it to say, there's a ton of questions to ask and the answers that we get will be quite interesting. Go ahead. Yep, that's exactly what I was just saying. So um, just a big thank you. You can go on to the final slide, Devin. Uh, a big thank you to everybody for tuning in. Uh, thanks to Devin for, for jumping on uh, this challenge with me of giving this talk. Um, and also thanks to the, the broader KUENM group. I suspect that the list of authors of this paper when we write it, will be 10 or 12 people because this has been a, a year and a half and it's been a lot of people, as with all of our projects, it's been a lot of people contributing
to resolving particular challenges or moving the project forward at different points in its evolution. So essentially this is this is a KUENM group project and and the collective uh, deserves a lot of, of thanks for their work in this. Any last thoughts, Devin? No, that's great. I agree. Um, it's been a lot of fun to work on this project with a lot of really smart and dedicated people. So looking forward to finishing it up. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thanks everybody to to for for tuning in, and uh, this wraps up uh, this week's set of talks, which is just one, but perhaps a longer one than our usual. Uh, but thanks for tuning in to to this latter part of the ENM 2020 course, and we'll see you in the question and answer session.